Well, we've been going through the book of James these last couple of weeks, and we've been exploring uh, the book of James. And in chapter one, we've learned that this chapter talks about walking with God through trials. In chapter two, chapter two helps us to learn to walk with God by developing our faith and our trust in him. Chapter three, we learn to walk with God by taming our tongue. Ouch, that was some message last week. I'm telling you what. Now, chapter five is going to be on you. to. Do. We've done the first three chapters. Today I'm going to do chapter four, but chapter five is your homework. You're going to go home and, and read chapter five. And chapter five deals with walking with God in patience and through suffering. In our final installment, we're going to do chapter four this morning. And chapter four, we're going to deal with friendship with God. Friendship with God. That's going to be our theme this morning as we look at chapter 4. Now, when we open up chapter 4, you're going to see that James begins to rebuke the church. He's rebuking the church because there's discord and division among uh, the, the, the children of God. And so he begins to address this, this uh, backbiting in, in, um, in, in the church and we find that in this chapter, that there, there are three elements that mitigate against our friendship and our relationship with God. There are three elements here that mitigate against our relationship with God. Number one is the flesh, right? The flesh. The flesh has to do with us, right? It has to do with the, the things that draw us away from God. It has to do with the things that bind us. It has to do, the flesh has to do with our, our habits and, our, and those idiosyncrasies that we have that keep us from friendship with God. So there's the flesh, there's the world. The world is the, is the system that we, we live in that constantly tries to get to distract us from God, right? All this uh, uh, social media, entertainment, our work, the world constantly pulls against us and mitigates against our relationship with God. And then, of course, there's our enemy, the devil, who is constantly, the Bible talks about he schemes. He's constantly scheming. He's constantly watching our lives to, to see where can he uh, interrupt that friendship with God. How can he get you to doubt God? How can he get you to, to veer off course from God? So those are the three things that, that kind of mitigate against us in this chapter. And I want to talk to you this morning about friendships, uh, friendship with God, specifically maintaining. How do we maintain friendship with God? We're going to look at James chapter 4 and verses 6 through 10. James chapter 4, verses 6 through 10. And I'm looking at the New International Version. And it says this, But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will free, flee from you. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. How do we maintain friendship with God? It's such a beautiful thing that, that he calls us friends, right? Right? He doesn't call us servants. He calls us his friends. Uh, there was a song that was real popular uh, a couple of years ago. It says, I'm a, I am a friend of God. And it was, it was just kind of sweeping the church for a while. And it, even though that, church, that song kind of faded out, how many know that our friendship with God hasn't faded? Amen. And so we need to learn to maintain friendship with God. And so I want to give you three practical principles to maintaining friendship with God. So if you're taking notes, the first principle for maintaining friendship with God is to relinquish control. Relinquish control. James chapter 3, verse 7. 
The Bible says, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Relinquish, relinquish control. The Greek word in that, in that verse, in that verse where it says submit, it's an interesting word. It's the word hypotasso. And you don't have to remember that word, but the meaning is, is significant. And so to submit means this, to submit to one's control. It means that, that God wants to control, but we've got to submit to it. It means this, hypotasso means this, it means to rule over. Submission means to rule over. It means with the implication of providing direction and leadership. It means, submit means to govern. In other words, what James is saying here, submit yourself to God, let God govern your life. Can I ask you a question? Who's governing your life? It means to submit to his control. It means to allow him to, to rule over you. It means to allow him to direct you, to lead you. There was a song, very popular song, that came out a couple of years ago, uh, a country song, Jesus Take the Wheel. And, and, and some of us, we got Jesus in the car, but we're showing him around. And, and uh, uh, the, the, the woman who... who uh, sang that song, she said, Jesus, you take the wheel. And for a lot of us, not, not everybody, I know this is going to pertain more to the 11 o'clock service, I got it, that we need, to, we need to tell God, take the wheel, because how many know that we think we got it under control, right? We invite God, you know, God, listen, I'm going this way, would you like to come along with me? And, and, you know, life is like that. It's, it, when you, you know, as you're serving the Lord for a couple of years and, and you become uh, familiar. In Spanish, we say, mucha confianza. That means you, you, got, you become a little bit too familiar with God, right? And so instead of allowing him to, to become the driver, we kind of ask him, come on, God, come along on the journey with me. And, and it's a trap that we can fall under if we're not careful. But we need to let God govern our lives. When, when we submit to God, we stop resisting his leadership over our lives. Because how many know that God longs not only for friendship, he longs for deep friendship. He's still Lord and he desires to lead us. The Bible says we are his people and we are the sheep of his pasture. Hudson Taylor said it this way, great missionary to China said it this way, Christ is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Recently, I was coming home from New York and I've driven, you know, I used to live in New York for, for most of my life. I lived in New York and I used to, uh, you know, so I know the road. I know the road. But I always have my GPS on when I'm driving. I generally, even if I know where I'm going, I, I always have my, my GPS on, right? And so I'm, I'm, I'm driving on the way back home, and the GPS is telling me to go a certain way. And I said, you know, later for the GPS, I'm going to take a shortcut. Did you ever do that? You know, you know where I'm going with this. So I'm going to take a short, I know better than the GPS. I didn't, I didn't say it like that. I wasn't yelling at the GPS or anything. I don't do it. But I said, I'll, I'll do it my way. So I, I got off. You know, there was, there was traffic. So I figured I'm going, to, I'm going to outsmart the traffic. And so I got off the, the highway. And I found out that the highway I couldn't go straight. I had to turn. When I got off the highway, I had to turn around and go, because of the way the road was, I had to go back down to where I was coming from. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to outsmart this thing now, because so, I know the roads, right? 
I lived in New York all my life, so I made a turn on whatever street it was, and I'm turning there, and now there's a blockade there. So I made another turn, and that street didn't turn the way I needed. I had to still go further down, and, and further down until I had to make another turn. And then I was way on the other side of where I needed to be. And before I knew it, I, I, w- I went over uh, all the way down to the west side highway, finally made it there, to, and then made a right, and it was more traffic. And when I calculated the time lost... In my mind, in my, I didn't say it out loud. I should have listened to the GPS. I didn't say it out loud. I was grateful that there was nobody in the car. How many of us know that God's view of what's up ahead is better than our view? He knows what's up ahead. But but we want to outsmart God. We want to show sometimes how smart we really are. And so we say, God, I know you're you're pushing me this way, but I want to go this way because I I think I can get there. And before we know it, we've lost time. Because his view, God is looking up here and he sees he sees the whole scheme of everything that's going on. And he says, I'm going to I'm going to divert the traffic that's ahead of you. I'm going to avert the, the, the obstacles and the things that are keeping you from going in the way that I want. I'm going to avert those things. His, his view is a lot better than mine. And when I when I take control of the wheel. I I found myself in some strange places. I don't know about you. When I take control of the wheel, the the thing that I, God, how did I get here? Did you ever say that to yourself? How did I get, this is not where I wanted to go. That's because I was driving. And I lost time. And some of us have lost time, we've lost money, we've lost relationships, and most important, we've lost that sense of the presence of God that's in our life because we haven't relinquished the control. Always getting quiet in here. <laughs> there, there are bad distractions in life. There are, there are things that, that I call bad distractions. And these distractions are obvious, right? There's lust, greed, materialism. Here's one that we don't call a distraction, pride. How many know pride got me off that road? How many know pride told me I knew where I was going? I didn't need any help. There are, there are bad distractions, and the enemy wants to throw these bad, he wants to distract you through these bad distractions to keep us from going in to friendship, having a deep friendship with God. But let me say also that the enemy will attempt to utilize good distractions. What are some good distractions? Work, entertainment, relationships. You know, I'm a news junkie. I love the news. And and I'll watch a news chapter, then I'll go to some other news, then I'll look up in the YouTube some news, and then I'll go to some periodicals that I look. I, I like to stay informed. And before you know it, a couple of hours has gone by. And Jesus went to bed. He said, I'm not waiting up for you. Amen. There are things that distract us. They're so obvious. They're, they're, they're pornography and, and greed and, and materialism. and, and uh, the, uh, uh, Those are, but what are the things that distract you? What are the things that God's been telling you? Put that thing down. Turn that TV off. I don't want you to watch that game today. What are those things in your life 
That God says, I want to draw you into friendship with me. I want to have a relationship with you. I want you to know my heart. I want to get to know your heart. But we're too distracted by things that are not necessarily evil and sinful. But they cause us to stumble nonetheless. And they become problematic in our relationship with God. Tim Keller said, idolatry happens when we take good things and make them the ultimate thing. So how do we refocus our life when we become distracted? Well, one of the keys to becoming undistracted and refocusing is getting into the word of God. The psalmist said it this way, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. When you start getting back into the word, it starts to remove the distractions. Well, Pastor Robert, you don't understand. I, I, I don't like the these and the thous in the Bible. Well, the, the, you know, there's not only the King James Version. You got New International. You got the New Living Translation. You got the Passion Translation. I, I was in my, in my Bible app the other day. When I was growing up in Christianity, there was the King James Version, the, the New Revised Standard, and that was it, two versions. And they were both hard to read. When I opened up my, do you know how many versions of the Bible there are today? There are about 50, 60 different versions of the Bible. Pick a version that you really love that speaks to you and get into it. Because that word, it's not just a book that we're reading. We're trying to get some philosophical principles of life. It is God wanting to speak to you. Amen. If you approach the word of God as this not only pay, uh, words on a piece of paper, but it is his living voice to you, you're going to approach the word much different and you're going to begin to love the word of God. David said, I've, I've, I've hidden your word in my heart. Look at what Jesus did. He was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, right? And the Bible says that the, the enemy, the devil, came to him. And he started, you know, trying to tempt him away from what the plan and purpose. How many know that as soon as you say, I'm going to fast, people start calling dinners, lunches. I, 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 I hate that. And can I be perfectly honest? When people call, when, when there's fast and people call for, for lunches and dinners, I go to the lunches and the dinners. And I tell God, I'll fast next week. You ever do that? Don't, do, don't you look so, so, so <laughs> sanctimonious. Boy, this is a sanctified crowd. I'll fast next week. And then next week comes, there's no fasting. Because you forgot, because there are other things you got involved. Distractions. Because the enemy came in and said, if you're really the son of God, if God is really talking to you, then do this. He tries to distract us. And how did Jesus deal with him? He said, it is written. See, let me, let me tell you something. The devil doesn't care about your opinion. How about that? I know we do. You know, it's interesting. My sister and I, we're very close. Actually, all my sisters and, and my brothers, we're very close. But we get into these philosophical discussions every once in a while. And we all, both of us are trying to prove who's, who's better at, at the philosophical discussion, you know. And, and we get deep and, and more deep. And, and I'm waiting for her to finish so I can throw in my stuff. How many know the devil doesn't care about your opinion? I like what the, the seven sons of Sceva said. We, we adjure you by the name of Jesus who Paul preaches. And the demon looked at them and said, wait a minute. Paul, we know. Jesus, we know. But who are you? See, your opinion doesn't matter to the devil. But when you say, it is written. When you say, this is what God says, all of a sudden, he has to back up. And this is what the Bible says. It's very interesting that he, the, the devil came to him several times. Jesus said it is written. And then it says that the, 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 the devil left him for a while. 
You see, you can push back the enemy and he'll flee and you'll find that, that freedom that you're looking for. But he's coming back. And the same thing that caused him to flee the first time is what you need to use the next time. We need to relinquish control by submitting to God and resisting the devil. And the Bible promises that if we resist the devil, if we submit to God first and resist the devil, that he will flee. He's always trying to, 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 to counter us. But God is with you, right? The key is that to remember that God will always be ultimately more fulfilling. His offers to you are more fulfilling than what the enemy has for you. I, I found out that when I get distracted to pursue something, a lot of times it's empty. It doesn't lead to any fulfillment in life. And the, it, it fulfills for a moment. How many know that sin is pleasurable? Why you got so quiet? You know I'm true. You know that's the truth. Sin is pleasurable, but the Bible says for a season. Sin is pleasurable for a season. Somebody once said, sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus, take the wheel. Would you say that with me? Jesus, take the wheel. To maintain friendship with God, we're going to have to relinquish control. We can't be know-it-alls. To maintain friendship with, with God, we have to run to God. James 4, 8 says this. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. You see, to befriend God, we have to be intentional about pursuing him. The Bible makes it clear to, to come near to God. It says, and the other version says, draw near to God. Draw near to God. Draw near to God. I love. What I, I looked up that that in in the Greek because I, I like to look up the words because sometimes things lose their meaning in our in our English language and and it, it doesn't have the power of just uh, what the Bible says. So I looked at that word "draw near," and to draw near to God means this: to move nearer to a reference point. It means to move toward. It means to approach. It means, I love this, I, I, I didn't even realize it was in there. It means to meet up with. You see, drawing near to God, it says, I'm going to hang out with God today. I'm going to meet with him today. He is my reference point and I'm going towards him. I'm going to move, I'm going to approach God. When was the last time you approached God? Songwriter, old song. This is for the old people in the church. You'll remember this. We got we to we keep the old folks happy, all right? So forgive me. And I'm one of them, so. How long has it been since you talked with the Lord and told him your heart's hidden secrets? How long since you prayed? How long since you stayed on your knees till the light shone through? I was thinking about that uh, actually yesterday in my own personal life. When was the last time that I locked the door and locked all out the transgression and I drew near to God and I said to God, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. I'm not leaving this place until that light breaks through. God, I need an answer from you. And the only way I find that answer is if I draw near to you. 
When was the last time that we, we threw out the, the baseball game tickets and we, we turned off the television set? We got in, locked the door and said, God, I'm coming for you. I'm coming for you. Here's the, the beautiful thing about this. It says, draw near to God. And guess what? He will draw near to you. He will draw near to you. The Bible says about John the Apostle. I love this. It's so tender. It says that he laid his head on the bosom of Jesus, on his chest. He was called John the Beloved. The Bible says of Mary, who was so enamored with her relationship with Jesus, who she realized where she came from. Do you remember where you came from? What is your story? That's why sometimes in church, if, if people sometimes get a little bit shaky and out of order and they, and you know, they lose control sometimes, I, it doesn't bother me because I don't know their story. I don't know where they've been. I don't know what brought them to the place where they're so rejoicing because they remember where they came from. Draw near. Draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. He'll come close to you. I want to be close to God. I want to run with him. How do we draw near to God is by confession. It's to acknowledge the sin in our life. That's why James said in that verse, wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, wail. Change your laughter and your mourning into to mourning and your joy to gloom. You see, we don't understand the significance. I'm telling you right now, we don't understand the significance of sin. I, I really believe that. I don't think we understand how, how offensive and alienating sin is. It wasn't that Jesus just died on the cross. The Bible says he was wounded for our transgressions. He could have gone to another method, but to be the sacrifice, to deal with the things that keep me from God, he was wounded for our transgressions. My God, God had to wound him. In order that I might be free. In order that I might ignore the GPS of my life. He was wounded. I know Easter is coming. And I want you to get that Easter message. But get it now. And so when there are areas of our lives that are not right. We need to confess them to God. Because how many know he knows about it anyway? It's interesting how we think, and I've done this, that nobody sees us. That we're doing things in the dark. The prodigal son went to a far country. Nobody knows, where I, nobody knows who I am here. But guess what? Where can we flee from his presence? We've, we, we've, got, to, we've got to confess our sins. Bring them, to the, bring them to the cross where, where the blood was shed. And then repentance. Repentance is heartfelt turning around from the things that we've, been in, uh, that we've been involved in. Purify your hearts. Grieve, mourn, wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. What he's saying there, that our offenses are serious before God. They're serious to God. And if we're going to continue to facilitate friendship with God, it's important that we repent. I, I put on my notes, we got to take out the garbage. Now I'm going to confess something here and they better not leave this room. Because <laughs> I'll, I'll know you guys said it. So the other day, you know, I, I work in, um, 
in central New Jersey, and it takes me a, quite a while to get from where I live down there. So I, I'm, I'm up very early in the morning, and I'm driving, and then coming back is another nightmare. So I didn't take out the garbage. I, I'll do that later. Don't look at me, you know, you're, you're such judgmental folks out there today. I'll take it out later. Next day goes by, I still haven't taken out the garbage. But when I walked in my apartment, I knew something was wrong because there was a smell in the apartment. You ever get there? Sometimes it's in the refrigerator. You know, you have to toss stuff out of the refrigerator. You open the refrigerator. Whoa, what's going on in here? May I submit to you that that's the way it is with sin and God? Is that, you know, there's a smell in the room. We don't smell it. We just, we're just kind of going, but God, you know, the angels are saying, P-U, what's going on down there? Holy Spirit's knocking on your door. Hey, go take out the garbage. Take out the garbage. That's what repentance is. It means taking out the garbage. Is there any area in your life that you know that God is not pleased with? Is it worth friendship with God? God continuously, eagerly, he stows mercy on us. And let me ask you something here. Some of you don't know Jesus. Some of you have come to church, but you've never really made a commitment to Christ. You've, God wants to be your friend. God has a plan for your life. God has a journey for you to get on, uh, get on to. And it's up to you to accept his journey. At the end of this message, I'm going to ask you, all of you that are here this morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you've never given him your life, if you never turned control over to him, I'm going to ask you to do that at the end of this message. My final point to maintain with God is we have to revere his name. James 4.10 says, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. Part of of recognizing your relationship with God is to humble yourself. Is to humble yourself. James is concerned at the beginning of the chapter that we're bickering and fighting with one another and there's no humility. We, everybody wants to be right. But let me ask you a question. Who has the authority in your life to correct you when you're wrong? We all need Community. We all need someone in our life to, to speak to us, to tell us, hey, you know what? You're going off on a deep end. Humble yourselves before the Lord. It says humble yourself, and then it says he will lift you up. How many know I've, I've done this in my life? I don't know about you. I've, always, I've tried to lift myself up. Tried to make myself credible. Try to, you know, burnish my credentials in front of people. And how many know sometimes it doesn't work? People don't care. But when God puts a spotlight on you, when God says, I will lift you up, humble yourself. I like what Pastor Ralph Sockman said this. True humility is intelligent, self-respect, which keeps us from thinking too highly of ourselves or too meanly of ourselves. Humility makes us modest by reminding us how far we have come short of what we can be. That's what the humility does. C.S. Lewis said it. He said, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. And why is that important? Why is humility important? Because James said this, God opposes. Did you hear that word? God opposes the proud. That word, he resists. When you're proud, God resists you. But he gives grace to the humble. He gives enabling power. He gives favor. There's nothing better than to have favor with the right person on your job, the right, you know, when your boss gives you favor, you don't even have to speak up for yourself because they're speaking up for you. There's something beautiful about having favor. And the Bible says when you humble yourself, he will give you favor. God said this, I dwell 
in the high and holy place with him who is a contrite and humble spirit. God says, I, I dwell with the humble. What's your relationship with God right now? Where are you in regards to the things in your life that keep you from true friendship with God? This is an hour. And we can't, we can't afford not to have friendship with God. There's so many crazy things happening in our, in our nation, in our world today. So much tumult and, 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 and upheaval that is going on. But in the midst of that, if we have friendship with God, We're going to have his presence dwelling with us. We're going to have his favor. We're going to have his enabling power. I want to close with this. Paul said, I am what I am by his grace. I'm going to ask you a question. Where are you at with God? What, what is God dealing with you about that, that you've turned off the GPS? What is God dealing with you about that, that you've run from his presence? You've been distracted. What is God dealing with you that you no longer, you're, you're so proud to revere his name that humility is lacking? What is God dealing with you about today? I want to ask you that question. Before we pray for you, I, I want to ask you another question. You that need Jesus today. This is your moment. This is your time. The gospel is the power of God to change your life, to turn you around, to give you a new life, to give you a new journey, to give you a new plan, to set you on a course that you've always been created to do. And it's not only setting on a course to do, but setting you on a course to be, to be a friend of God and to be all that you should have been. If you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus, I want you to pray this prayer. I'd like everybody to pray this morning. If you close your eyes for a moment, just in, in humility to the Lord. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ, you've never given him your life, this morning he's here. And if you will confess with your mouth, this is what the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, as we'll be talking about shortly, you will be saved. Because, listen, it's with the mouth confession is made and it's with the heart that man believes you have to say Jesus come in that's what it says confession say Lord I need you I've, I've not served you but this morning I want to give you my life if that's you this morning I want you to pray this prayer would you do that I'm only facilitating it it's not that my prayer is better I'm just trying to help facilitate this time between you and God would you pray this prayer if that's you say Jesus I'm a sinner I need forgiveness. I want to walk with you. I want to be your friend. I want you to be my friend. So today, Jesus, I give you my life. Today, I walk with you. From this morning on, I will live for you. And I will pursue you. And I will follow your plan. In Jesus' name, amen.